Introduction by Gabriel Kuhn. The German Revolution of 1918 to 1919 is a curious phenomenon, not least because the jury is still out on whether it really was a revolution, or, more precisely, whether the revolution was brought to its end. To this day, Social Democrats celebrate the end of World War I as Germany's transition from Kaiserreich to Republic. Radical Socialists, on the other hand, bemoan the betrayal of the revolution's proletarian ideals and of the communists' radical labor organizers and anarchists who fell victim to the Social Democrats' collaboration with reactionary military forces that paved the way to the Weimar Republic. The Weimar Republic, named after the eastern German town where Germany's Republican constitution was drafted, was an attempt in dem democratic parliamentarianism that never functioned, instead causing the rise of fascist organizations in the 1920s, among which the National Socialists emerged as the strongest force, eventually seizing power in 1933. This propelled Germany, as soon the rest of the world, into a disaster of unspeakable dimensions. One of the most compelling questions with respect to the German Revolution is what would have happened if would the world have been spared National Socialism if a Socialist Republic had been established? Would Socialist Republics in both Russia and Germany have triggered many more Socialist Revolutions, at least in Europe? Or would two competing Socialist systems have been established? Could the entire history of socialism have been different? Could the anarchist influence have created a less bureaucratic and centralist socialist model? On the one hand, there is little point in pondering these questions. History cannot be undone. On the other hand, there's a lot to learn from history's course and from the consequence of what was and was not done. It helps strategizing for the future. This is one of the hopes connected to this publication. All Power to the Councils is the first English language history of the German Revolution based on original documents by active participants representing all of the radical factions involved. There exists a few general histories of the German Revolution in English, some of which are very good and highly recommended. See the bibliography for details. However, most of these histories are written from a strongly communist perspective and focus almost exclusively on the role of Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, and the Spartacus League. While the Spartacists played an important role in the, in the events, their politics were not uncontested in the radical left, and in some sections of the proletariat as well, as in certain regions, unionist, syndicalist, and anarchist influences were equally important. Furthermore, while historians have so far summarized their research in monographs, which make for useful introductions and overviews, most of the eyewitness reports of the German revolutionaries have remained untranslated. In this sense, the volume presented here hopes to contribute to the ongoing study of the German Revolution by providing first-hand accounts of active revolutionaries compiled in a way that chronologically traces the revolutionary developments. Using the introductory glossary and timeline, the background information to the individual chapters and texts, and the annotations, even the reader unfamiliar with the broad strokes of the German Revolution's history should not lose sight of the revolution's narrative being able to also read this book as a general history of the events of the events. At the same time, the English readers already familiar with the history shall find new texts and therefore perspectives and analyses that should deepen their understanding of the events and inspire their own perspectives and analyses. The main radical factions during the revolution were one, the communists, first organized in the Spartacus Bund, uh, the Spartacus League and the International Communisten Deutschlands. There's a lot of German in here that I have no idea how to pronounce, but I'll give it my best shot. International Communists of Germany, or the IKD. Then the Communist-ish Partei Deutschlands, uh, the Communist Party of Germany. The KPD, founded by the Spartacus League and the IKD on January 1st, 1919. I take back what I said about trying to pronounce the German in here. I'm going to skip it. <laughs> the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany, or the USPD, founded in 1970, 1917, when the left wing of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the SPD, split from the mother party in protest against the SPD's continued support of the war. All Spartacus League members were part of the USPD before founding the KPD. Radical labor organizers, most notably the revolutionary stewards, who were predominantly factory workers with long experience in union struggles and strong trust among the radical proletariat. The anarchists, most notably uh, Gustav Landauer 
and Eric Musham. The differences between these factions will become apparent. The Spartacists, while critical of what they saw as authoritarian tendencies in Bolshevism, most clearly expressed in the writings of Rosa Luxemburg, regarded a strong communist party as, an, as a necessary requirement to protect the revolution and to establish a proletarian council system. Most USPD members were open to certain parliamentarian concessions, mainly to avoid armed conflict. The revolutionary stewards championed the direct involvement of workers in the administrative apparatus drawing on their experience as labor or They criticized the Spartacists for their alienation from the working masses and for their insurrectionist tendencies. At the same time, both the communists and the revolutionary stewards perceived the anarchists as politically inexperienced utopians. The anarchists, for their part, were champions of federalism and formulated a strong critique of what they saw as the centralist tendencies of the Spartacists and of the revolutionary stewards' focus on the factory workers and big cities. Despite these tensions, however, the different radical factions never hesitated in defending and honoring each other in the face of social, democratic, and bourgeois attacks. Landauer, for example, gave the Munich eulogy to Karl Liebknecht and, Rosen and Rosa Luxemburg after they were murdered in January 1919. Musam called Luxemburg, quote, the flame of the revolution, unquote, in an obituary published in, the, in his journal Cain. All of the radical factions were also united in their commitment to a council system and their opposition to bourgeois parliamentarianism. Although it captured the hopes of many revolutionaries and wide sections of the proletariat, the council idea was not very developed in Germany at the time. Inspiration came from the example of the Russian Revolution, experiences in workplace organizing, and a few texts by an Antony uh, Panikik, and I'm not sure how you pronounce that, I'm going with Antony Panikik. Only after the revolution was the council system explored in more theoretical depth by authors like Otto Ruhl, Karl Plattner, and Eric Musham. Nonetheless, uh, all power to the councils was the common rallying cry of the radicals during the revolutionary period. The defeat of the revolution had various causes. The vagueness of the council idea, the lack of common organization and strategy, the lack of revolutionary experience, the counter-revolutionary tendencies within the SPD, the remaining strength of reactionary forces in Germany, especially within the military, the exhaustion of the workers and soldiers after years of war, the propaganda of the press, the prevailing conservatism of many sections of the population, the lack of deeply rooted internationalism, etc., Reading the text compiled in this volume, one cannot help but feel that the belief in a German council republic was often naive, that actions were hastily conceived, and that enormous tactical errors were made. At the same time, the commitment of the revolutionaries is inspiring. Many of their observations and insights are extremely valuable for revolutionary theory, regardless of place and time, and there is plenty to be learned from their mistakes. All this, I believe, lifts the text far above mere historical interest. In this context, it was extremely interesting to work on this volume as a so-called Arab Spring. The 2011 revolutions and uprisings in the Middle East unfolded. It was so apparent that many of the Arab revolutionaries faced questions that were essentially the same that the German revolutionaries had faced almost 100 years earlier, or for that matter, pretty much all revolutionaries throughout history. What do we do once a tyrant is gone? How do we facilitate a true transition of power? How do we establish political and economic institutions that really alter the forms of government and production? What is the role of the military and police? What are the actual demands, needs, and interests of the people? How do we secure democratic and social progress? How do we defend the revolution? How do we prevent reactionary forces from using the situation for their own ends? How do we go from mass rebellion to a mass effort of building a new society? How do we turn a radical moment into long-lasting radicalism? The list of questions is long. This book does not contain any answers, but many reports and reflections that shall help us find some in the long run. The vast majority of texts included in this book appear in English for the first time. The quote-unquote Icarus paper on the revolt in uh, Wilhelm Schaven, originally written in English, and the texts by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg are the exceptions. The latter appear in new translations, mainly to have consistent terminology throughout the volume. All translations are by Gabriel Kuhn. 
All of the included texts have been written by eyewitnesses and active participants in the revolution. Some were written during the events, some afterward, some are descriptive, some analytical. What ties them all together is their author's direct involvement. The structure of the book follows the most important sites of the revolution in chronological order. Wilhelm Schaven and Kiel, where the uh, sailors revolt in late October 1918, triggered the revolution. Berlin, the capital and therefore a natural center of activity. Brunswick, a stronghold of the Federalist visions of prevalent outside of Berlin and Prussia. Bremen, where the first Council of Republic was established. Bavaria, where the best known Council of Republic was proclaimed. The Ruhr Valley, where workers turned the resistance against the reactionary cap putsch of March 1920 to one of the last proletarian attempts to establish a council system, and the Volkland in eastern Germany, where the where communist bandits, quote unquote, communist bandits, led courageous campaigns against the bourgeois order until 1921. With the arrest of the most charismatic leaders of the Wurtland rebels, Max Holz in 1921, the persistent effort to give the German Revolution a, clary, a clearly proletarian character despite all obstacles finally found its end. Radical workers' rebellions flared up in Germany until 1923, but these were isolated incidents no longer carried by the mass movement of 1918. Each chapter and each text are briefly introduced. A timeline and glossary of key organizations, personalities, journals, and terms are included for easier orientation. Other explanations have been added in notes. Information on individuals mentioned in the text has been added whenever it was available and information on geographical places whenever this seemed necessary to understand the narrative. All notes are by Gabriel Kuhn unless, uh, unless specified. As many terms as possible were translated into English. When an English translation might have been misleading, the German term has been retained and explained in a note. Sometimes a very specific German term follows the English translation in parentheses. English translations of German names and book titles follow the original in square brackets. Uh, now, this isn't in the book, but for the most part, I'll be reading what's in the square brackets and not the German, if that option is available. Some key terms of the history of the German Revolution have been translated differently by English translators. Brat has been rendered both as council and Soviet. Volksbeauftragte, both as people's delegates and people's commissars, and so forth. In general, I have avoided English terms that evoke the Soviet Union's political order, such as Soviets and people's commissars. As the situation and the debates in Germany were quite different, at the same time, it also seemed important to differentiate. For example, there existed Dat Kommissar and Volkskommissar next to Volksbürfracht. During the revolution, which makes a terminal, terminological distinction between, in this case, state slash people's commissars and people's delegates, useful. The language of German writers at the time, both male and female, was marked by an inclusive use of male terms. Given the many problematic implications of a modern cleansing of historical texts, the original patterns have been reproduced. Readability has been a priority in the translation work in order to make the text included in this book relevant for a contemporary English audience. When this demanded a liberal rather than a literal translation, I opted for the liberal one. Needless to say, no liberties were taken that, in my judgment, would have jeopardized the intentions or contents of the original. As always, many people deserve thanks for having made this publication possible, apart from the folks at PM Press. These include the wonderful staff at Stockholm's our Workers' History Archive and Library. Wolfgang Eckhart, Theo Panther, Mark Harfeld, Chris Hirt, Ralph Klein, Regina Wamper, and Sigbart Wolf. I probably butchered all of those, but that's fine. So that's the introduction. Uh, this next section... Wilhelm Schaven and Kehl. The beginning of the German Revolution lies at the North Sea coast. As often in history, it was sailors who first openly rebelled against the authorities. There was already a North Sea coast revolt by sailors of the German fleet in the summer of 1917. It was crushed, and its instigators, Max Reichspeicht and Alban Kobus, executed. Uh, the trigger for the October 1918 revolt was the order by the uh, Navy command to embark on one more battle against approaching warships, although Germany's loss in the war already seemed certain. On October 29, hundreds of sailors in Wilhelmshaven refused to follow the Navy's command orders. They were arrested and transferred to the prison in Kiel, or Kiel, 
where a broad solidarity movement with rebellious sailors emerged, including both soldiers and workers. Some people even traveled from afar to join a huge demonstration in Kiel on November 3 to demand the sailors' release. The authorities responded with violence, killing seven and severely wounding 29 protesters. This only increased the anger among the population and made the rebels more determined. On November 4, SPD politician Gustav Nosk arrived in Kiel and was elected chairman of the newly formed Kiel Soldiers Council. And in glossary, uh, the SPD is a Social Democratic Party of Germany uh, founded in 1890 as a, as a successor to the Socialist Workers' Party of Germany, SAP, one of Germany's main parties to this day, also called Majority Socialists or Right Socialists, to distinguish them from the USPD. On November 4th, SPD politician Gustav Nosk arrived in Kiel and was elected chairman of the newly formed Kiel Soldiers' Council. It was the first act of SPD infiltration among the revolutionaries' ranks, a theme that will mark the coming weeks and months. Meanwhile, unrest was spreading from the soldiers and workers in Wilhelmshaven and Kiel to other parts of the country. In Hamburg, Bremen, Hanover, and many other cities around Germany, soldiers refused to obey orders. Workers went on strike, and broad sections of the population demanded the authorities to step down. The stage of the German Revolution was set. The texts in this chapter are eyewitness reports from Wilhelmshaven and Kiel. The so-called quote-unquote Icarus paper is an account about the Wilhelmshaven events written by Ernst Schneider, a communist union organizer who was active in various organizations including the IKD, the KPD, and the KAPD before escaping Nazi Germany in 1939. IKD being International Communists of Germany, founded in late 1918 by the Bremen Group, uh, left-wing radicals and other radical socialists, formed the KPD with members of the Spartacus League in 1919. The KAPD is the Communist Workers' Party of Germany, founded in 1920 by a revolutionary faction expelled at the October 1919 KPD Party Congress, split into various groups in the mid-1920s. And the KPD is Communist Party of Germany, founded 1919 by members of the Spartacus League and the IKD, after the left majority of the USPD had joined the party officially carried the name uh, the KPD from 1920 to 1922. After the Nazi regime, the party was revived in West Germany but had no big influence. In East Germany, it became a part of the Socialist Unity Party, or the SED, in 1949. Schneider was nicknamed Icarus after a spectacular prison escape in 1920. He wrote his report in British Exile in 1943. It covers the period from the Sailors' Rebellion at the end of October to the final attempt of radical Wilhelmshaven workers and soldiers to protect their councils against the increasing power of the SPD and its bourgeois allies in late January. The second text is an abbreviated version of Karl Artelt's report on the Sailors' Revolt in Kiel, Artelt was a radical soldier and a USPD member who played a leading role in the revolt. Although Kiel became the center of the revolutionary revolt after the arrival of the sailors arrested in Wilhelmshaven, the radical resistance to the SPD waned quicker, not least because prominent SPD politicians arrived in the town early on, and many of the most radical sailors moved on to other places. Then, uh, the next section, the Wilhelmshaven Report, a chapter of the revolutionary movement in the German Navy 1918 to 1919 by Icarus. Uh, <laughs> written in English and self-published as a pamphlet in England in 1943, while the original British spelling has been retained, some orthographical details have been adjusted to this volume's format. The version we printed here is also slightly abbreviated, focusing on the actual description of events in Wilhelmshaven, leaving out some general political reflections and historical references, not least because the latter are often hard to verify. Omissions in the text are marked. All footnotes have been added by the editor-translator unless specified. The original pamphlet includes an introduction whose author remains unidentified. The following observation might be the most important, especially since Germany had seen its share of sailors and dock workers strikes and rebellions since at least the mid-19th century. It is essential to note that the service in the Imperial Navy was compulsory for every German seaman. The crews of the merchant's fleet were almost identical with the sailors on board the warships. The rest of the men of the war fleet were recruited from the other sections of the industrial proletariat. Thus, they had not only the same interests, but also the same insubordinate spirit.
author's note, the history of Toilers of the Sea has yet to be written, but when it is, it will form part of the history of the forward-storming vanguard of the proletariat. I, who had a full and active share in those events, consider it my duty in the interest of the working class to record the following account, even at the risk of not avoiding inaccuracies, so that whosoever wishes may understand. Until the year 1935, I had in my possession the complete archive, but it had to be burned for reasons of safety for my comrades and myself. Those documents are, of course, lost, but it's better to lose documents than to lose one's life. After all, I have kept my head, and I am therefore able to make further use of it. The war clouds g gather over Germany, the rank and file of the German labor movement at that time in numbers, the mightiest movement in the Second International urged for measures against the approaching war. Crowded mass meetings were held, and the slogan was given, Mass Action Against the War. But words, mere words. The mass of the workers under the influence of the organizations, strongly organized and disciplined in party and trade unions, were waiting for the call to action from the trusted leaders, but the call never came. Instead of action, came complete p political collapse. In contradiction to their previous teachings, the spokesman of the Social Democratic Party of the German Parliament on August 4th, 1914, declared, In the hour of danger, we shall stand by our fatherland. The majority of the SPD leaders had found their fatherland. The workers were still without one. The problem of masses and leaders remained politically unsolved, despite the prolonged struggle of the revolutionary socialists such as Rosa Luxemburg, Antony Panikek, Heinrich Laufenberg, or Laufenberg, uh, Johann Neif, and others, whose devotion to the cause was unquestioned against the then already flourishing policy of class betrayal. The overwhelming majority, majority of the SPD leaders rejected the idea of self-determination of the working class and worked secretly through their revisionist apparatus for the subordination of the proletariat to the bureaucratic organizations. The catastrophe was unavoidable. Many workers felt that their vain. They had not understood the dynamics of their own organization, so they felt betrayed, and they were. That brought disillusionment on the one hand, irritated nerves, and indifference on the other. But still, things went on. This next section, titled The Secret Committee of the North Sea Fleet and the Naval Base of Wilhelmshaven. Uh, Leibniz's call, down with the war, the principal enemy is your own country, was not in vain. It encouraged the opposition forces against the war. On board the cruisers, destroyers, torpedo boats, and other small fighting units, a whispering campaign went among the sailors, and now and then acclamations. Eis lebe Leibniz. Meanwhile, signals were given by a secret committee, later known as the Revolutionary Committee, or for short, RC. The committee issued definite instructions, warnings, information, and slogans, and these signals were promptly transferred from mouth to mouth within a certain alliance. No member knew more than two comrades, one to the right and one to the left, like the links of a chain. The first link was known by only one comrade, the committee. Under the cover of seamen's yarns in the lower decks, in the lockers, the munition rooms, the crow's nests, the fighting mass, even in the laboratories, an underground organiza organization was built up which did its share towards stopping the imperialist war and sweeping away the semi-feudal monarchy. The examples set by this underground organization are of historical importance. Besides the organization of the RC, where there appeared some instances of individual peace propagandists, who were almost wiped out with the execution of two harmless conscientious objectors. The sailors, Reichpeitsch and Cobes, their struggle formed part of our own struggle, and therefore they died for us and our cause. In this connection, it is a fact that a representative of one of these unfortunate sailors who consulted some prominent SPD members of the parliament was shown the door. The SPD members of parliament were not interested. Meanwhile, the unrest grew among the seamen in the fleet. A purge of the, of the crews of certain ships was ordered by the commanders of the fleet, but the growth of the movement was far ahead of the measure taken by the naval authorities, and the purging was, no doubt, more of a nuisance than a wholesome cure. Suspects, always the wrong ones, of course, were promptly ordered off to their company's naval barracks. From there, thousands of seamen were ordered off to the, to the Marine Division on the coast of Flanders. In March 1917, leaflets written in block letters signed by the committee by the committee, were distributed by the sailors of the 3rd Sailors Regiment. Later on, meetings of the seamen were held at the East End Park. These meetings were, of course, illegal, 
but they were well protected. Without doubt, the underground movement in the Navy did not stop on the gangways and accommodation ladders of the warships. A left radical member of the movement whilst on leave in Hamburg in April 1917 was one of the 18 participants of a secret meeting arranged by a Hamburg woman comrade held in the woods near uh, Gross Bortzell or in the inn. Zun uh, Grunen Jaeger. The result of the meeting was a broadsheet addressed to the women workers in the war industries and to the soldiers. Two days later, after 5,000 of the leaflets had been spread among the people and placarded on the walls and buildings, spontaneous strikes in the war industries followed. Dozens of strikes and leaflet distributors were arrested and imprisoned. It must be noted that our active friends in Hamburg were all women war workers, shorthand typists, etc., who placarded the broadsheets. Many of these heroines and comrades, as well as the printer, a businessman who was not a member of the movement, were sentenced to penal servitude. Our sacrifices were heavy. To mention one's own personal sacrifices would be invidious. A fighter is bound to fight and suffer. To do so in the cause is comparatively light. True enough, we must fight for the peace. If not, then it is the peace of the graveyard, the peace that will press down in Europe and other parts of the world in a new era of darkest reaction. That's a quote from Rosa Luxemburg. Our task could only be to double our activities in the movement on board the warships and on shore. In July 1917, an example was given by the seamen on a squadron headed by the battlecruiser Prince Regent, which lay anchored in the lower Elbe. At the order, weigh anchor all hands to action stations, some signs and gestures were made by the seamen, but no move was made to obey the order. Their own orders, fires out, proved mightier than the orders of the chiefs of the fleet. Hundreds of sailors were sentenced to penal servitude from 1 to 15 years. This event and the attitude of the Admiralty showed the situation in general. Clearly, flurry and excitement among the authorities, but a staunch determination in the lower ranks. Again, the seamen had shown that they did not shrink from armed resistance. They knew that they could only succeed by concerted action by the seamen of the fleet as a whole in close collaboration with their comrades in the army and in the industries. Theoreticians who exaggerate the differences between the theory and the living reality may go astray, but seldom the practical fighters. The outlook of the latter was right. In July 1918 occurred the spontaneous strikes in the armament industries, followed by plundering of bakeries in the Reich, then followed months of remarkable silence. It was the silence before the storm. Towards summer, a meeting was held in the Edelweiss, the biggest dance hall in Wilhelmshaven. The meeting was protected by columns of the underground movement of the fleet. It was late in the evening. The dance hall was filled with sailors, girls, and a few civilians. The orchestra had left the stage during the interval when suddenly the great curtain of the stage fell and shouts were heard. Quote, Stay where you are. Do not move. Unquote. Then from behind the curtain was heard a loud voice, impressive and convincing. Quote, We were on the eve of decisive occurrences. There will be, at last, no more war, no more oppression of the toiling and bleeding masses, but we must fight on, hard, long, and bitterly for the sake of the cause. No imprudence. Our day is coming, unquote. It came. In September, a secret conference of the various groups of the workers' opposition took place in Berlin. Representatives of a number of industrial workshops from northern, eastern, central, and western Germany were assembled. Summarizing the reports of the assemblies that the independent worker activities were constantly increasing all over the Reich, it was urged that the revolutionary class must violently explain its program to the broad masses, regardless of expense, and that this was to be carried out without delay. Instead of the term socialism, the term communism, that is, the association of free and equal producers into free communes, was adopted. A manifesto, written by the late comrade Frenken, in order to enlighten the social democratic duped masses, to untie them from their careerist leadership, was issued in many thousands of copies, and some days later distributed within reach. At the end of October 1918, there was a spate of cases of insubordination and disobedience among the sailors at the base of the North Sea Fleet, and an outburst appeared inevitable. Warships of all classes and types were alongside the docks and quays of Wilhelmshaven. Major ships, including the battleship Baden and the battlecruiser Hindenburg, were ready for action and awaiting orders from the chief of the fleet. Ships anchored outside the docks and in the Drade River, the cruiser squadron, torpedo boat, and destroyer flotillas were 
also ready for action. Rumors circulated to the effect that it had been decided to engage the enemy in a final encounter, in which the German fleet would triumph or die for the quote-unquote glory of the Kaiser and the Fatherland. The sailors of the fleet had their own views on the quote-unquote glory of the Fatherland. When they met, they saluted one another with a long-live Leibnacht. The crews of the ships moored at the quayside were to be found, most of the time, not on board, but in the workshops and large lavatories ashore. Officers, contrary to custom, carried revolvers and ordered the men to return to their ships. The men obeyed, but meanwhile others had left their ships and swelled the number ashore. The situation was favorable. The committee passed the message, Garden meeting after dark at the new soldier's cemetery. Send a delegate from every unit. According to the rules of the secret organizations, delegates had to proceed to the meeting uh, alone or at most in pairs at a suitable distance so as not to attract attention. The meeting took place and showed how general was the response to the call of the committee. The meeting place was guarded by sailors. Those present stood, knelt, or sat between the graves. There was no time for discussion or speeches. The names of the ships moored in the harbor and river were called, and out of the dark, the almost invisible delegates just answered, Here. One comrade spoke briefly but firmly, quote, The time has come. It is now or never. Act carefully but resolutely. Seize officers and occupants. Occupy the signaling stations first. When control has been gained, hoist the red flag in the main stop or gaff. Up for the red dawn of a new day, unquote. In accordance with the rules of the organization, all had to stay in their places for 10 minutes after the speaker had left. Fortunately, it was a dark night. On the return to their ships and barracks, some of the comrades heard the heavy tramp of marching troops. Shots were fired and the cry went up, Down with the war! The sound of marching came from sailors, some 300 in number, under arrest, who were being taken under escort to the train to the Oslobhausen prison near Bremen. They were warmly cheered by the passing sailors. When a dozen or so sailors were passing the building of the Admiralty, they noticed that the guard house was occupied by soldiers from a town, Marksen, in East Friesland. It was a machine gun detachment. The sailors, without hesitation, carried out an attack and, in a moment, had captured 15 guns. The commander of the detachment, an old sergeant major, after a short palaver, declared himself in solidarity with the sailors. The sailors then marched to door A of the Imperial shipyard, and upon reaching the watch, found it already in the hands of the revolutionaries. Continuing towards the battleship Baden, it was seen that the small units had also been taken over by the revolutionary sailors. On board the Baden, they elected a new commander. He was a member of the committee. By this time, the dawn had come. Shots were heard on board a small light cruiser lying in dry dock, and the white ensign was seen to be still flying in the main top. After a struggle of about an hour, every ship except Hindenburg was in the hands of the revolutionaries. From the Hindenburg, the white ensign still flew. The commander of the Baden signaled, surrender or we shoot. A struggle was observed aboard the Hindenburg, and a detachment of stokers and firemen on the Baden prepared to board the Hindenburg and give a hand. But before they reached their destination, the white eagle ensign was hauled down and the red flag hoisted. At the same time, the signal was received from the cruiser squadron that, there too, the revolutionaries had gained the upper hand. At the orders of the committee, a mass meeting was held outside the building of the Admiralty. A great crowd of 20,000 attempted and later marched round the naval base headed by the 15 torpedo half flotilla. A comrade announced that all the commanders and admirals of the North Sea Fleet had been deposed, and as long as they kept their quarters, they would suffer no harm, but if they moved, they would be dealt with. Three or four commanders entered the Admiralty building and informed the Admiral what had happened. His Excellency answered regretfully that he could not do anything for the moment. He was informed that for the moment nothing would happen to him if he remained quiet and stayed at home. By this time, the crowds of war workers were streaming into the streets. It is regretted to have to state the fact that sections of the workers were still waiting for a call from their anti-revolutionary leaders and to be forced to be free. Their behavior, as also was their leaders and the bulk of the quote-unquote white-collar proletarians, was consciously or unconsciously reactionary during this period. Events moved quickly, big demonstrations took place, and processions converged at the training ground. After speeches and reports on the events, elections of workers and sailors' councils were held. Every ship had its council and delegate. The same was done for each factory and town district. 
That evening, a meeting of the delegates took place, which constituted itself as the revolutionary government. A council of 21 sailors was elected, which was, so to speak, the administrative government. This, in its turn, elected a body of five members with executive powers. But when the first meeting of, the council, of this council of five took place, it transpired that four of the members were not revolutionary socialists. The fifth member told the others that the revolution could not be made by namby-pamby revolutionaries and that he could not successfully work with them. Circumstances, however, allowed them to carry on for some time. In fact, there were from the beginning two governments in Wilhelmshaven, the Council of Five, with its headquarters in the Officers' Casino and the Revolutionary Committee, backed by the Revolutionary Socialist Seamen, with headquarters on board the, the Baden and in the Thousand Man Barracks. By this time, power was practically in the hands of the workers, soldiers, and sailors' councils, if not all over the Reich, at least in Wilhelmshaven, Bremen, and Brunswick. The revolutionary proletariat pressed for a clear decision. Street and barricade fighting in towns and villages was the order of the day. Shot columns of, revolution of revolutionary sailors were sent to all parts of Germany. For the purpose of ensuring permanent communications with Kronstadt, Several hundred fully armed sailors were sent by the Revolutionary Committee to occupy the wireless station at uh, Nauen, near Berlin, at that time still in the hands of the Ebert government. Uh, also, fair warning, I uh, have no idea how to pronounce any of the German words. They never returned. After fruitless attempts to capture the station, many of them went on to Berlin and formed, under the leadership of an Imperial Army officer, the Revolutionary Socialist Lieutenant Dornbach a friend of Karl Liebknecht, the Volksmarine Division. Our own attempts to get in touch with revolutionaries in Kronstadt from Wilhelmshaven wireless stations were unsuccessful. Our messages were jammed, first by a station somewhere in Finland, and later by uh, Nauen. In the situation, by now it was November 18th, the leaders of the trade unions joined the big industrialists in the Arbeitsgemeinschaft. Regarding this, Hugo Steins writes in his mem uh, memoirs, I quote from memory, We were completely beaten in this hopeless situation. There came the great man uh, Legion, chairman of the General Committee of the Trade Unions in Germany, as our savior. He did, in fact, save us, and this shall not be forgotten. Steins did not forget a millionaire industrialist and one of the biggest ship owners in Germany. He named one of his biggest ships Karl Lagen. If ever a working class in any country in the world was treacherously betrayed, it was the German working class. Let us lift the curtain. It was K. Radek, then Russian plenipotentiary in Germany, who declared openly a, victori a, quote, a victorious workers' revolution in Germany now means a lost revolution in Russia, unquote. Stalin, discussing the situation in Germany in 1923, urged, quote, In my estimation, the German workers must be restrained, not spurred on, unquote. Indeed, as time has shown, the Comintern has not only bloodily liquidated the genuine revolutionaries in Kronstadt and in the Ukraine, but also has purposely prevented the workers' revolution in Germany. The seamen supporting the Revolutionary Committee felt that it was their duty to carry forward their activities and assist their class comrades at all costs. To do so, they were determined even to make use, in case of necessity, of the units of the battle fleet, which, though bound by the clauses of the armistice, were still armed and fit for use. But there were other difficulties to be faced. Hundreds of thousands of workers were still held in the bonds of obsolete systems of organization, dominated by conservative leaders. This was glaringly illustrated on the occasion of the first General Congress of the Workers' and Soldiers' Councils of Germany in Berlin, December 1918. Sounds unbelievable, but our quote-unquote revolutionary parliament it was found necessary to form a revolutionary group. And when Karl Liebknecht, as the chief speaker very rightly pointed out, quote, the counter-revolution is in the midst of us, unquote. Some of the delegates raised their rifles against him. In the meantime, the Berlin government had printed large posters which were plastered on the walls and buildings of towns throughout the Reich, though not in Wilhelmshaven, Brunswick, and other places where the revolutionaries were in control, with the inscriptions in big reading, quote, socialism all over Germany, unquote, quote, socialism is marching on, unquote, etc. 
what in fact marched on. Were, however, were the old reactionary forces led by the people, quote, emancipating social democracy, unquote. Their chief newspaper, Vorwarts, twice captured and run by the revolutionary workers in Berlin, but later recaptured by the Social Democrats, published at a time when hundreds of workers were being killed in street fighting in Berlin, the following incitement, quote, Wir hundred tot in einer Reihe Rosa and Karl sind nicht dabei, unquote. To the social democratic propaganda in favor of a national assembly, the revolutionary communists replied with, quote, No national assembly. Arm the workers in the factories. Establish revolutionary tribunals to try the war criminals and counter-revolutionaries, unquote. At this time, the civil war was far from its climax. The decisive battles came later. New formations of the industrial workers were just marching up to the front line, they fought their battles not as party men or trade unionists, but as independent revolutionary factory units. In this very critical atmosphere, December 28, 1918, a party was born, which after long and vehement discussion was called the Communistische Partei Deutschlands, or Spartacusbund. Um, in January 1919, I was commissioned by the Conference of the IKD of Northwestern Germany to negotiate with Karl Radek, the then General Bolshevik, a uh, plenipotentiary in Berlin, and discuss with him ways and means for establishing wireless communication between Wilhelmshaven and Kronstadt. I rushed by a special loco engine to Berlin to conduct my mission immediately. Searching for Radek in vain throughout the day, throughout that day, I accidentally met Karl Liebknecht at midnight, who told me that Radek was hiding in the suburbs in a certain flat of the Workers' Cooperative Society. Mass strikes raged in the city and its surrounding districts. No buses or streetcars were running. When I, after a strenuous journey, arrived at Radek's quote-unquote secret flat, the latter was occupied with some exciting lady visitors. At last, a political debate took place, and it became clear to me that the Bolshevik Party dictatorship did not concern itself with the task of developing the world revolution. Next section, titled Prospects and Possibilities. Early in January 2019, the situation in general was, mo was fully understood by the class-conscious seamen in Wilhelmshaven, who were mostly quartered in the thousand-man barracks on the submarine training ship Deutschland, and in smaller vessels, such as destroyers and torpedo boats. To make sure that nothing should go amiss, the seamen set about educating and training themselves. Lectures were given on Marxian socialism, communism, and strategy on board ships and ashore, instead of the discredited as a result of social democracy term quote unquote socialism the term quote unquote communism was adopted in close cooperation with the revolutionary socialist workers groups in northwestern germany and the industrial centers of westphalia or the Ruhr district a strategic plan was drawn up to drive the reactionary forces from the waterside and southwestern germany towards berlin such a plan it was the thought was better than to allow the reactionaries to fight on ground of their own choice it was hoped also to relieve the revolutionary forces locally and conquer Berlin for the oppressed class. The revolutionary seamen of the North Sea Station were also determined to fight to win or die for the cause. They swore that the old class society should be ended never to arise again, that there should be no more slavery, no more capitalist war, that they had had enough. To describe in words the spirit of these seamen is impossible. In their minds, they saw a new worldwide society of workers free without fear or want, a society based on worker democracy developing into a single unit of mankind. On January 15, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were murdered in Berlin by officers of Ebert's soldiery. In Wilhelmshaven, a general strike was proclaimed by the IKD, which had at that time, apart from several hundreds of industrial workers, more than 500 members of the seamen of the fleet, mass meetings and armed demonstrations were held on the flagstaffs of the warships and the flagmast of the thousand-man barracks, the red flags fluttered in the wind at half-mast. The proletarians of the sea were mourning two beloved comrades while the murder-provoking writers of Vorwarts had his bloody prize. Nothing could better illustrate the spirit of the seamen than the fact that when on the following day, January 16, an attempt was made by the reactionary under Dekofizir, uh, quote, to free Wilhelm Shaven from Spartacist domination, unquote. 
the revolutionaries taught them a lesson in fighting that few of the white guards could have expected. After six hours of street fighting, during which several persons were killed, the Bunder Dekofsir surrendered unconditionally. The street leading to the Jackman Bridge was littered with abandoned rifles and machine guns. Some of the officers gave a promise not to take up arms again against socialist revolutionaries, and it was later proved that they had kept their word. Whether or not this rising was inspired by the Ebert government, the result was a defeat from the old militarist forces. The seamen supporting the committee fought their opponents openly and smashed them several times, but none of the officers were executed. Towards the end of January, the tension grew among the seamen. Berlin fell, Kiel also. Bremen was attacked from the rear by a large army, although a system of sailors and workers' guard posts had been organized in Wilhelmshaven and the surrounding districts, and an emergency tribunal was sitting to deal with the counter-revolutionaries. This was far from being enough. What Wilhelmshaven needed, and still needs, and not Wilhelmshaven alone, was a full-scale revolution from the ground up. It was clear that this would not be achieved in collaboration with the old personnel of the soldiers and workers' councils, but only by bringing in fresh blood from among the ranks of the socialist revolutionaries of the committee and its active fighting units on sea and land. In the economic sphere, the committee envisaged an association of free and equal producers based on a system of workers' democracy utilizing, since it would probably be isolated, the gold of the uh, Reichsbank as a means of exchange with capitalist countries, and of course, that meant the gold could not be used against the revolutionary workers. The great hope seemed to be Russia. In any case, there was no time for talking. The final moment had arrived for acting, if unsuccessfully, then as an example. The next section, titled uh, The Revolutionary Wilhelm Shaven Commune. The struggle along the whole waterfront in northwestern Germany increased in ferocity, and the revolutionary groups fighting under extremely difficult conditions around Bremen were wiped out after a stubborn resistance. In this situation, the Revolutionary Committee in Wilhelmshaven ordered ashore all available sailors of the fleet, supported by some torpedo boats that were at anchor but ready for action in the Jade Bight, to fight the approaching White Army. The advanced squads of sailors marched from 15 to 20 kilometers from Wilhelmshaven to the front line, taking up their positions in trenches dug long before. These squads, each from 10 to 30 sailors, with an elected steward or confidential man, undertook to hold their ground against the advancing army of Ebert's troops. The seamen fully understood that their 3,000 men with little experience of fighting ashore would hardly be a match for an army of 40,000 experienced officers, but they also understood that the fight had to go on at all costs, and that in the interest of themselves and the cause, there must be discipline. Voluntary discipline based on affection and trust. They treated their own delegates as well as the comrades in command with brotherly love and respect. Meanwhile, the thousand-man barracks was put into a state of defense. Machine gun rifles, ammunition, and hand grenades were distributed and stored on all floors. Machine guns were mounted on the roof of this mighty and massive building. On January 26, at 12 p.m., the RC proclaimed a state of siege throughout Wilhelmshaven. The old soldiers and workers' councils were, were removed from office. At the same time, the Reichsbank, with 21 million in gold, was seized, and the bank building guarded by a special troop of 50 sailors and 15 machine guns. Besides the Reichsbank, all other financial institutions were seized and occupied by armed sailors. Further, all statistical bureau, postal, telegraph, and telephone offices, water and electricity works, all means of transport and traffic, railway stations, food and raw materials, depots, printing shops, and all government buildings. Trains were stopped. They could come in but not go out. In five different broadsheets, printed in huge letters, uh, placarded, all over the town were given the essentials of things to come. Workers, old aid pensioners, all toilers in distress, particularly those who lived in huts and wooden barracks, were told to seize the almost empty houses of the rich and occupy them immediately. This was done without delay. There were also many previous prisoners of war who were freed without any discussion of the, quote, different races, unquote, and nationalities. Class consciousness had solved these, quote unquote, problems on the spot. Quote, it is the social existence of man that determines his consciousness, unquote. On January 27, in the forenoon, 
One of the stock houses, which was crammed full with provisions of the Navy, was opened by order of the RC and many thousands of kilograms of salt meat, salt pork, bacon, peas, rice, and tin foods were distributed gratis among the Wilhelmshaven inhabitants. Those in need received according to their necessities. Meanwhile, information was received from the observers who were watching the movements of the approaching army that Wilhelmshaven was cut off on all sides except the waterfront and that some of the sailor units supported by a small boat gun had already opened the battle with the advancing Ebert troops. In fact, those, these comrades were in touch with the officer and troops who rested them and lost ground. By this time, fighting was going on in the streets and at the barricades to Wilhelmshaven. Heavy losses were inflicted on the reactionaries who fought in close column. A hail of hand grenades descended upon them from the roofs and windows of the houses and their shouts. Ebert, Scheidman, were drowned by those revolutionaries, quote, Liebnicht Luxembourg, unquote. Again and again, the followers of Ebert were driven back, but even again, a new officer columns appeared, mostly to suffer the same fate. Sometimes the firing down and the only single explosion were heard, but then it would break out again, a roaring hurricane in a sea of splinters and wreckage. In these circumstances, 34 fatally wounded comrades, amongst them Comrade A, were moved to a torpedo boat, which shipped them to a small town on the Lower Elbe. Meanwhile, as the night grew on, the 14-hour battle from the thousand-man barracks began. Among the 588 defenders, mostly sailors from the battle fleet, were a dozen or so workers, some of them women, and dressed in sailor's uniform. An 18-year-old girl, the daughter of a naval officer of high rank. In a very short time, a, a shell of medium caliber crashed into the gymnasium, followed by others which fell around the barracks. Disagreeable odor, something like gas, filled the air. Then shells began to burst at short intervals in the western part of the building. But the sailors had their turn too. Volunteers were called for. Comrade C took the lead, and within half an hour, he had smashed up a column of officers, taken three prisoners, and captured two heavy machine guns and a 5.3 centimeter gun. The battle went on throughout the night, reaching its climax in the early hours of the morning, when mine after mine was hurled into the barracks. Fireballs and star shells were let off, and the darkness changed to night and f to fire and light. But there was no sur thought of surrender. Several attempts were made to storm the barracks, but each time the white guards were repulsed by, by the machine gun and rifle fire of the defenders. While the fighting was in progress, two meetings were held in the basement dining room of the barracks, and at both meetings it was resolved to fight on to the last, and no circumstance to give in. But while it's true that Ebert, that the Ebert soldiery had suffered terrible casualties, so too had the revolutionary sailors and workers. There is no purpose in describing the harrowing scenes witnessed during the struggle. Only one shall be mentioned here. Comrade H, mortally wounded, breathed, I'm, quote, communism or death, unquote, as he clasped the hand of the man next to him, and his fellow combatant knelt down and kissed the forehead of a brother in arms he had never known before. It was daybreak, two comrades were still firing the only machine gun left undamaged, and from the masthead of the thousand-man barracks was torn down the tattered flag of the Wilhelm Shaven commune, riddled with gunfire. Here ends a chapter, but a chapter only, of the history of the revolutionary proletariat of the sea.